Your name is Carcat Vantis. You are presently inside of a meteor laboratory with 11 screeching hooligans all arguing at the top of their voices about what just happened. What was that thing? Asks a bewildered feline soprano. It nearly killed me, proclaims an aristocratic tenor. What are we going to do? Wails a bovine alto. Everybody shut the hell up, growls a scratchy crimson voice above the others. The voice, of course, is yours. Outside the door of the laboratory behind you is the wreckage of your poorly landed ship, still smoldering from the getaway you had to perform to escape from a black carapist demon with snarling teeth and green lightning. No one knows what that was, okay? You say, pointing a finger at the audience in a broad sweep. So everyone shut the hell up and stop speculating. You hesitate, listening to the silence of the room. You feel breaths building in your chest more quickly than normal, your blood pusher thudding away with unusual heaviness. Whatever that was, you say slowly. It shrugged off shots that would have impaled the Black King we just killed. Before we freak out, we need more information. There's a doubtful murmur in the assembly. Perhaps we should return to the victory platform from whence the beast came, suggests a deep voice. Equius crosses his arms, stepping forth. We escape through the door and leave the beast to our empty game session. No, says a simple monotone voice from the back of the throng. It's the mechanical Aradia Megiddo, her sleek metal body fading into the gray walls of the room. It destroyed the doorway. We won't be able to enter the new universe. Do we know that door is the only way into the new universe? You ask, directing the question to anyone. There's uncertain muttering. The victory platform is supposed to be the last thing we see, Aradia continues. It means we've won. We're supposed to open the door and claim our reward. If there's another entrance to the new universe, that defeats the purpose. You notice one of the group has wandered off to the computer stations lining the walls of the room. Gamzee's horn are seen slouching over a lit-up monitor. In your distraction, the muttering in the group is getting louder, and you raise your voice to draw command back. Two problems, you say. We don't know who or what the fuck that thing was, and we need to fix the victory platform. I say we take Equius' suggestion and focus on leaving instead of fighting some crazy fucked up demon. Oh... Uh. Leader, <clears throat> Equius's voice cracks. He shivers unwholesomely. Our leader has wisely accepted my suggestion. Does anyone know anything about repairing victory platforms? I don't think it was intended to be broken to begin with, moron, says the sulky voice of Salix. I think we're basically just fucked. That's no way to think chimes in the chipper voice of Feffery Pisces. She's standing near Solix and gives him a shove that seems more playful than admonishing. We're part of a noble race. We can think our way out of this. Where do we start looking for answers? This time, Kanaya speaks up, always the pragmatist. Especially considering the demon who may or may not be actively hunting us. Oh, boo, hoo, hoo. There's a voice that makes everyone turn to look. Vriska is leaning against a wall, head down, her hair curtaining her features. It's hard to see her expression in the dim light. A big, scary demon came and broke a door. I'm so frightened. Vriska steps closer to the crowd into the light. Her one visible eye shines brightly, her mechanical arm whirring on her shoulder as she points an accusing metal claw at everyone. You crying wigglers are so afraid of some demon right after we killed the Black King? Give me a break. This guy's probably just some extra secret final boss who we get to fight for beating the game so quickly. Let's regroup and kick his ass, then a new victory platform will appear. Friska's energetic words fail to inspire. Miss Circuit's testimony may be credible in terms of game trends, but I fail to see supporting evidence, says Terezi tersely, without looking at Friska, who scowls. Did you call me Miss Circuit? What a load. If you're all too cowardly, I'll fight him alone. Friska scuffs the floor with a shoe. I'm with Circuit for once, says Aridin from the near the middle of the group. His voice is bitter. 
You pussies need to face your problems. Shut the hell up, Thawne. Solix mutters from his corner near Feffery. Aridin hears this and stands tiptoe to try to muscle his way to where Solix is. You want to say that to my face, Gutterblood? Aridin spits. <gasps> Aridin! Feffery steps in front of Solix as if to shield his ears from profanity. Don't use such hemoist slurs! Arguing breaks out in the group, a din rising to fill the small gray room that you're occupying. There are a few shoving matches and numerous snarls, but you don't have anything to say to stifle the din, your voice catching in your throat. Before, no matter the odds, there had been a path forward, something for you to do. Now, a demon on the loose and your group in disarray, there is no clear path. You stand slack-jawed watching everyone bicker until you're jarred from your stupor by a haggard voice. Yo, cockhead! Gamzee calls above the roar, silencing it. Everyone looks at Gamzee, then to you. The light of the monitor frames his face in a strange glow, his usual face paint smearing beneath the eyes, giving him a gaunt look. You don't reply simply looking at him. He speaks, pointing to the screen. Doc wants to talk to you. Oh, one last thing. I hate to be a bother, but may I borrow Mr. Vantis for a moment? We will be in touch later. Oh, uh, cool, yeah, one sec. Do be a chap and delete our message log before he saunters over. Done. Okay, K-Man's on his way. This is K-Man. I mean, this is Carcat. Hello, Mr. Vantis. I understand there has been some tumult amongst your group as of late as a result of a certain unwelcome visitor. No shit. Did Gamzee fill you in? How did he get in touch with you? Oh, <laughs> serendipity. I am at liberty to share some information with you regarding your demon friend. Okay. I won't bullshit you, I'm kind of at a fucking loss here. It's kind of hard not to start basically losing my goddamned mind. So if we could skip the KG games here, Doc, I sure would just go positively ape shit with joy. Very well. The demon is from the universe you just created. What? It came from your new universe. Your universe, Universe A, created a new Universe B. Sadly, your craftsmanship was lacking. Lacking? What the hell is that supposed to mean? Oh, far be it from me to judge another man's craftsmanship, Mr. Vantis, but you and Miss Merriam cut a few critical corners in the universe breeding process. Thanks for letting me know after the fact. Sure is helpful and encouraging to hear that. Has anyone ever told you you're a wonderful and easy-to-talk-to guy? On many occasions, sarcasm notwithstanding. The long story short of the matter is this. The demon comes from Universe B. I have the means to connect you with Universe B. I will have more information given time, but for now I have to relay this information through you to Mr. Captor. <laughs> he doesn't much care for me, you see. The feeling is spreading. I'm sure. But you're still going to do what I say, because you're the one who ruined a perfectly good universe. <sighs> Show these to our yellow-blooded friend. This will unpack into a familiar operating system. Install it on the computers in this laboratory. You will find the Trollian program you use to instant message your peers pre-installed with added functionality. The broad strokes of the matter is this improved Trollian application you will be able to communicate with Universe B. That's all for now. Fine. In spite of your pointless criticism, I suppose you want me to thank you for helping us out. Oh, it couldn't hurt. Well, stay wanting, jackass. You realize that several of the group have been watching you from behind the seat. You swivel to face them with a blush. Dr. Scratch has just told me... You begin, unsure of how to parse what you've just been told. ...that he knows where the demon came from. Let me guess... Terezi says, crossing her arms, her blank red eyes narrowing. He was sent here from the universe we just created. Makes sense, concedes Radia. They sent us a demon? Tavros asks near the back. But why? We didn't do anything to them! 
Whatever the reason- You stand. We might be able to fix this. You point at Salix. Doc sent us a program that might be able to contact this new universe. We'll stop them from making this fucked up demon to begin with. Salix sits in the chair behind you, clicking on Doc's file, typing lightning precision. I've never seen a programming language like this before. Salix mumbles. Are you sure we can trust Scratch, Carcat? Those fuckers sent us a demon. You find yourself saying emphatically. Because they probably resent their creators. They want to fight their gods before they ever arrive. As their gods, it is imperative we teach them a lesson. There's a dubious murmur from the dodecafold assemblage. Time doesn't work the way you're describing, Karkat. Aradia warns from the back. Before anyone can heed this warning, other voices spring up. We should focus on killing this demon fucker, not worrying about who sent him, says Aridin, standing near Vriska. I'm all for teaching these scum a lesson, says Terezi bitterly. Why are they angry in the first place? Says a sad Feffery leaning on the back of Salix's chair. They should love their gods. Look, whoever wants to help troll these idiot aliens is welcome to join. Anyone else, don't get in our way. You point at Aridin and Vriska. And no going to fight this fucking demon until we know more about him. Otherwise, we're going to come after you. Got it? Consensus is far from reached, but tenuous acceptance seems to have coded your cohorts. After a while of more murmuring and scowls, the group dissipates, some heading deeper into the lab complex through doors, some remaining in the main computer room. Salix is going from terminal to terminal, installing the new and improved OS with Doc's version of Trollian. Soon, only you, Salix, Feffery, Aradia, and Terezi remain. Here's how the software works, Salix says as you watch over his shoulder. It looks like you can contact this Universe B and send them messages on their internet. Internet only exists for the last few dozen sweeps of their main planet Earth, and not even the whole planet has it. Barbarians. The other four agree. There's something else, says Salix, clicking a curious white sphere icon. The program, titled Albus Aspectus, opens to a blank screen with a command line and prompt. The window simply says, Input Time. You give Salix a prod, encouraging him to do so. With an annoyed glare, he types the number zero. You and Salix cry out in shock as the screen suddenly lights up with an explosive white shimmer, quickly fading into swirling gray, the light becoming a single point, then a faded dot within mere seconds. The space behind the light swirls and shimmers, still bright but quickly dimming. In the faint light, you think you can see something forming, swirling in a faint green light in the center of the singularity. It looks like this is the beginning of Universe B. Hold on. Salix squints at the screen through his bicolor glasses. Before you can look closer at the green shape taping in form, Salix navigates away. Salix types the number 10 billion. On the screen appears a barren brown planet lazily orbiting a yellow star. It looks like one of the numerous desolate planets from your own universe. This must be the main planet of the universe. The planet that sent us the demon, Salix mutters his theory, and having no others, your group silently agrees. It looks barren. Terezi appears, leaning on Salix's chair next to you. Salix's chair sags back, and he shoots you both an annoyed look. Salix types something else in a different syntax. The beginning of sapient life. The command line can evidently process complex requests, because the screen flashes again showing a different view of the planet, now blue and green. Salix zooms in, scanning the planet, now lush with alien plants and odd animals. On the screen, you see a closer view of what appears to be a shining city, filled with trollinoid beings of many colors. Look at those things, Salix says. No horns. The sky is blue, Terezi says with a <laughs> chuckle. They must be diurnal. Look, the sun isn't frying them alive. Salix types more, testing different prompts. The flashing screen makes you dizzy, but you can't look away. The viewport showing cities, towns, day, night, all the different time periods of this strange alien world squeezed into the window on Solix's monitor. 
I don't think this is a computer program. Solix concludes. The syntax is too general to be a binary software. Solix types beginning of civilization and the prompt returns options. Local ant, local bee, local termite, and global human. What's a bee? Terezi asks, pointing at the screen, taking a strong whiff for a better look. Mind if I lick the screen? I can taste the words better that way. As Solix makes time pass on the monitor, you watch them fight with guns and cry out in pathetic struggle. Then at the end, you see the meteors fall, just like they did on your planet. What a pointless species. What do we do now? Asks Terezi loudly, shaking you from your thoughts. Solix finally snaps, wiggling back and forth on your chair to shake you both off. You can find out your own fucking selves, he says. There are like 20 computers in here. You don't have to lean on my chair. Solix squints. It looks like the human scrub on an internet site called VG Facts. Maybe start there. You and Terezi quickly decide to find your own computer stations. Feffery resumes her post on the back of Solix's chair. Unlike you and Terezi, he doesn't seem to mind Feffery hanging off him. You turn back to your own terminal. There's something you've been wondering about this whole time, something that you saw a flash of when Solix displayed the beginning of Universe B, that green shimmer in the center of the screen. Beginning of the Universe, you type into Albus Expectus. This time, you shield your eyes to avoid the strain, watching the flash cool from white to gray to black, distant nebula forming in the beginnings of ancient stars. In the middle sits a singular figure, a being, a canine with pointed ears that stand straight up on his head and a long snout. The being crackles with green sparks, floating through the void, exploring its creation a trail of nuclear energy following in its wake. It plays and it swirls, its white fur rippling in spite of the vacuum of the emptiness. Your blood pusher speeds up. You swallow down the sense of awe on your tongue. This alabaster dog, their first guardian, this is him. This is your wish. After another epoch, The alabaster dog landed upon the volcanic crags of the human planet before water flowed forth on it. Upon this craggy crust, the alabaster dog curled up and slept, choosing this place to be where life grew. Millennia passed, and the alabaster dog watched over this new planet as humans were born. The dog came to live on an island in the middle of the planet's deep oceans, near the frog ruins from which the game's code was now to be found. Later still, visitors to the island found the alabaster dog, an explorer with strange facial fur and a cadre of adventurers. You scowl. How did these idiotic flesh monkeys corrupt your noble protector? You have to find out. On the screen, the dog frolics and plays with these humans, turned over from the fuzzy man to a tiny girl with dark skin and darker hair. Something strikes you as familiar about the dog. Familiar in a dreadful manner, from its crackling green energy, to its pointed ears, to its toothy snout. Those are features of the demon that those ungrateful Universe B fools sent you. Why? Why does the demon bear the face of the alabaster dog who you sent to Universe B to watch over these creatures? You navigate to a place in the timeline, a time when the alabaster dog is alone, away from its flesh monkey protector. There it is, on a strange snowy land. No doubt this is Universe B's session of scrub. Far away, the black-haired monkey thing is wandering aimlessly with a scrub sprite. You have to stop this. Maybe you can change the past. You can prevent this dog from ever becoming the demon in the first place. You have to act. Your name is no longer Carcat Vantis. Your name is Beckworld, the Alabaster Dog. Woof, 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 woof. Love Jade. Jade, nice. Long black hair. Nice human. Good pets. Cuddles. Woof. Love Snow. Snow fun. 
New place. New land. Fun snow. Ah, snow makes nose cold. Brr. Fun to have nose be cold. Even if nose cold, hurt a little. Where's Jade? Two Jades now. One Jade sad. One Jade angry. Love both Jades. Hmm, confused. Woof. Jade's talking. Leave Jade's alone. Talk to Jade later. <laughs> Love Jade. One Jade sleeping. You roll in snow. Woof. Hey. Voice and head. Nice voice. You love voice. You look for voice. No one there. Hmm. Ah. Voice in head again. You bark. Maybe a voice find you. Invisible voice? Voice seems important. Uh, can you hear me? You cock head. Confused. Mm, you lick crotch. Good answer for being confused. Can this mutt hear me or is it just a dumb fucking lucis? You bark. Not dumb. You smart. You know lots. You know all important facts. Love Jade. Squirrel tastes good. Mitochondria is powerhouse of cell. If you can hear me, bark twice. You better do what voice says. Voice sounds important. Woof, woof. Okay, fucking Christ. You need to stop that thing over there from fucking everything up. Do you understand me? You lick crotch again. Voice not making sense. You wish voice would say something nice like treat or irradiated steak. Look at the black-haired thing. You look at Jade. Love Jade. Wag tail. You love voice. You wonder if voice and Jade would be friends. Thought makes you dance. You dance in snow. Snow goes everywhere. That thing. Yes, the thing with the glasses. Love Jade. Love Jade. You need to kill that thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? No. No. Kill Jade? No. Thought is funny. Killing Jade bad. Voice is so funny. Kill it! Do it now! I'm your master! <sighs> voice sounds mad. You cock head. Why voice so mad? Voice not friends with Jade? For good measure. You lick crotch. Just... Okay, don't kill it. Yes, voice making more sense now. Just stop it from fucking everything up, okay? Fucking up? You don't understand. You bark. Jade and other Jade don't hear. Too snowy. M maybe stop it from finishing the game? Do you see that green thing in the sky? That thing is bad. You look. Up high is green glowy. Voice says it's bad. Very bad. You growl at green glowy. Good. If the flesh thing tries to go green glowy, just... Just don't let it, okay? You hear loud and clear. Woof. To make sure voice knows you understand, you lick crotch. Does this fucking thing even understand me? <clears throat> Whatever. Voice stops talking. You whine. Voice seemed not happy. Voice should be happy, you think? Mmm. Woof. Too long since you got pets from Jade. You walk to Jade in snow. Normally, you would just zap to Jade, since you can zap wherever you want. You wonder why Jade doesn't zap places when she wants. She always used his legs. Zapping much better. But, oh no! Other Jade is carrying Jade. Other Jade flying up. You bark. Other Jade is taking Jade to Green Glowy in the sky. No! You bark again, mind racing. You zap. No time to walk in fun snow. Before Green Jade can go into Green Glowy, you zap to her. You try to push her away, but your paw goes into Other Jade. Uh, other Jade screams. You feel something. Both paws are inside Jade now. Her body and your body are coming together. You bark, squirming. What? No. Jade is your... You look up. Too late. You go into Jade's body like rock going into water. The last thing you see before going in Jade is going through the green glowy. You can't lick your crotch to get out of this one. You are no longer Beckwirl. Your name is Carcat Vantis. Well, that was the dumbest thing you've ever seen in your fucking life. 
To its credit, the alabaster dog did seem to obey you, but only in that it got into a meaningless kerfuffle. You sigh. Frustration has made this endeavor seem idiotic suddenly. All you managed to do was boss around a dumb dog. Whatever. It's not like this action had any greater consequences or significance to the broadness of paradox space or anything. Right? You are no longer Carcat Vantis. Thank you for listening to Homestuck Alternate Universe. HSAU is sponsored by contributions from viewers like you. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash funkmclovin. This episode was directed, recorded, and edited by Funk McLovin. The cast, in no particular order, A.E. as Terezi, articulately composed as Rose and Mom, Bucky as Carcat, Captain Lazar as Jack Noir, Eclippy as Gamzee and Equius, Janaya as Kanaya and Jade, Pocken as Tavros, Technically Dead as Salix, Harper as Vriska, Shrimp as Nepeta, and West as Feffery. Art by Sunny Dionysus, Gastro, and Clown's Kiss. Supplemental art by Funk McLovin, based on characters by Andrew Hussey. Special thanks to Daft Class, Yoitz Crow, and Andrew Hussey. Homestuck Alternate Universe is not affiliated with What Pumpkin or Viz Media. To read Homestuck's original webcomic, please go to homestuck.com or bambosh.dev slash unofficial dash homestuck dash collection. Thank you.